great to be here. Um, I appreciated the long reading, especially because we were allowed to read it, but it extends things. And I'm going to talk a long time. My goal, you see, is to use up all the time so I have questions. That's why I always try to do these things. Um, I have not yet read uh, Professor Eklund's talk, so I just heard it. It was a terrific talk. Thank you. I was trying to think whether what I'm about to say is going to be a complete contradiction of what you've said, or whether it will be a concretization of what you've said. And maybe you can think about that as I go on. Um, try to uh, read Mark 13 for insight into politics makes many people nervous. And we heard a little bit about that already. Jesus' words about wars, earthquakes, sorrows, persecutions, darkened skies, cosmic disasters, and words that needs to be said that appear at length in three of the four Gospels and permeate disparate parts of both the Old and the New Testaments, these words have lost a consistent theological context in our day to be understood very seriously. The images are too closely linked to certain forms of millennialism, or premillennialism, that are deemed grossly irresponsible by many. Stoking, and Professor Eklund mentioned this, uh, an almost ravenous desire, so it was thought uh, a few decades ago, especially for things like nuclear annihilation. And somebody like Pat Robertson was one of the people who epitomized this sort of thing. And not only premillennialists, one researcher in the late 1980s when the issue of nuclear arms control was at the front of public discussion found that a deep drag on such efforts uh, at uh, arms control in the U.S. was that many people in America found at the time the Bible to be put, to be, as he put it, quote, literally true. That was a problem for nuclear disarmament. And I quote from a study, for millions of Americans, and he did this complex statistical analysis of, of the American population on this matter, for millions of Americans it seems futile to try to reduce the chance of global devastation because nuclear war, in their view, is inevitable. It has been foretold after all in the Bible, unquote. Now, not just sociologists, but serious political scientists also worry about such things. As a recent book entitled Catastrophism, The Apocalyptic Politics of Collapse and Rebirth, and Rebirth demonstrates. The issue in this volume is not Christian fundamentalists, but their secular epigones, ecclesi uh, ecological doomsayers, dark browed economists, and so on. Effective social revolutionary politics, according to the authors of this book, need different narratives. And one of them argued this in an essay in the book uh, evocatively titled, Dystopia is for Losers. In this perspective, Mark 13 is a problem, even a dangerous one, and certainly an unhelpful one, because if politics and, and responsible Christian politics should follow uh, the early modern and modern project of ordering societies justly through the construction of effective forms of collective decision-making, that's what democracy and liberal democracy is all about, and even revolutionary democracy, then either we refrain, reframe the literal sense of Jesus' words, or we ignore them. What we do not do is take them seriously as stated. But perhaps we should. That's my question. So in what follows, I'm going to cover three things. I'm going to sketch broadly three as uh, key aspects, first of all, of the interpretive history of Mark 13, coming down on Luther. Secondly, I'm going to consider the category of catastrophe itself as both a political category and a scriptural one. And finally, ever so briefly, I will indicate how a Christian politics of catastrophe may have some concrete imperatives of potential interest. So let's start with Mark 13's history of interpretation. The history of Mark 13's interpretation, as it turns out, at least as far as I can see, is relatively thin. Largely because Mark itself was not a gospel that was frequently commented upon singly or in its entirety. 
Indeed, in what follows, I'm going to have to refer to commentaries on Matthew 24 and Luke 21 just as much as to those on Mark, and simply engage what I will call Jesus' catastrophic thinking. The fact that, as we know, much of the Christian tradition until recently was less interested in engaging in an exegesis specific to a given evangelist is itself significant, but that's for another discussion. Here I am interested only in the major lines of approach to dominical catastrophism. While these lines are often mixed up a bit, the basic distinctions are fairly clear. So by and large, in fact, there is a steady tripartite categorization of reference that readers have seen in this teaching of Jesus. First, and we can take Mark 13 as, as an example, that is. First, there's the category of the Jews. They take up half the chapter in Mark's version, say verses 1 through 13. Almost all interpreters, that is, are clear that Jesus' remarks in these verses regarding the temple, wars, persecutions, are all fundamentally aimed at his Jewish contemporaries and at the immediate context in which the apostolic church would be oppressed by both Jews and Romans. Now this was a historical claim, and commentators from uh, often link the text to specific events involving Roman emperors, we heard from Professor Eckman in some of these, and the chronology of Jewish demise trolling writers like Josephus to emphasize the historical reality of divine judgment upon the Jews. So somebody like Hilary of Poitiers stands as an example, quote, he's commenting here on these words of Jesus, all this happened in Jerusalem just as it had been foretold. The city was consumed, ruined by her stonings, by her expulsions, by her murder of the apostles, by her hunger, by war, and by her captivity. For having rejected the preachers of Christ, she was shown to be unworthy of God's message and not worthy to exist." Unquote. This emphasis is then often used as a contrast with the unexpected triumph of the church, exemplified in someone like John Chrysostom's habitual practice of contrasting the two. I quote from him. Quote, O oh, strange and wonderful facts, countless myriads of Jews did the Romans then subdue, and they did not prevail over twelve men fighting against them naked and unarmed. What language can set forth this miracle? For they that teach need to have these two things, that is to say, dispossess vulnerability, to be worthy of credit, and to be beloved by them whom they are instructing. Unquote. That is to say, for Chrysostom, it is the apostolic suffering of the early church that has given us our now relatively peaceful Christian existence. And the disappearance of the Jews politically is what allowed that to happen. That's the first part of the text. The second category of the text that touches upon the reference of verses 14 on in Mark 13 are these. These are almost universal in the tradition, understood to point to the, quote, last days, leading up, that is, to Christ's second advent and final judgment. Antichrist, terrestrial disaster, and so on, are all pressed into a future that, whether distant or near, is nonetheless, quote, unknown on Jesus' own terms. In general, the interpretive traction here is given in terms of moral preparation. Jesus' catastrophic remarks, then, are temporally divided into two periods, Jewish catastrophe and eschatological catastrophe. The third category of reference, then, in the tradition in the chapter, has to do, finally, with the inner life of the Christian and of the church. And this is the least consistent category in the, uh, in the history of interpretation. It involves either taking aspects of the first category, Jewish demise, and extending them to the church's enemies subsequent to the Jews, heretics, for instance, infidels, or allegorizing aspects of Jewish oppression and demise so as to refer spiritually to the Christian soul, beset by sin and driven to a kind of flayed existence before God. The temple destroyed is not only the body of Jesus, thus, but the body of each individual, and assaults upon it are due to sin. 
Usually these texts of destruction then are linked to John 2, 19 through 21, where resurrection and its hope is then brought in. Taken as a whole then, the standard approach to uh, John 13 and, uh, and uh, parallel texts of Matthew and Luke is to present the text as referring to three things. One, wicked Jews in the past, containing or contrasting with a virtuous apostolic witness. Second, an unknown future before which we should be warned. And finally, an interiorized display of eternal life and death through which we might be prepared. Thomas Aquinas' Catena Aurea on Mark 13, as well as parallel text, epitomizes this outline in an exclusive manner. That's exactly all he says the text has to say. Now, what is missing in all of this, of course, is today. I say the historical today, the historical present uh, of our era. And it is here that I want to bring in Luther and spend a moment with him. For Luther marks a distinct change in interpretive custom. And it's a powerful and extensive one, I believe. Later in his life, Luther took over preaching duties in Wittenberg and delivered several long series of sermons, including one on the entire Gospel of Mark, Matthew. Excuse me. His treatment of Jesus' catastrophic teaching is extensive and unique, and I believe that it deserves scrutiny. Like the tradition before him, Luther maintains a sense of both past historical reference and future reference. Thus, he has no problem, which obviously is no surprise, with Luther in seeing Jesus' initial remarks about the temple's destruction and subsequent war as directly aimed at the Jews and at their perfidy. He's been doing that for decades already. Likewise, the latter part of Jesus' teaching here envisions catastrophic events that must indeed precede the end of time and judgment. But unlike the earlier tradition, Luther is in fact most interested in today. All of the horrors that are announced and warned by Jesus, killing, division, uproar, as he puts it, quote, applies to us, unquote. And he spends most of his energy over several sermons on the topic, outlining the nature of the today that Jesus is indicating to 16th century Germans to whom Luther is preaching. Now, Luther is hardly naive or unconsciously moralistic in making this move. He underlines the way that Jesus and Matthew and Mark and Luke in their own way too, he says this, quote, mingles the times, unquote, in a deliberately confusing way in his discourse. Jesus speaks of the history of Jerusalem in his own day and immediately after, but he also seems to be speaking of the end of the world at the same time, in such a way as to bring both, Luther says, into the present, beginning and end. Quote, it is also usual for the Holy Spirit to speak this way in the Holy Scripture, unquote. He then goes on to give a long example of what we would call a spiritual interpretation of story as an example for how we are to read uh, Matthew 4 in this case, or Mark 13. And in talking about Genesis here, going back there, he explains how scripture uses a Hebrew word that literally means to build when describing how God oh, created Eve out of one of Adam's ribs. That is, God built up Eve like a building. And he like Jerusalem, like the church, in fact. On this base, Luther argues, Paul's use of Ephesians 5, of the creation story of Adam and Eve given in marriage as a sacramental figure of the Christ and the church, all, it all makes sense. Quote, the Holy Spirit often uses phrases like this, quote, to order, in order to unveil how the ages of the worlds interpenetrate one another. That is, even the initial verses in Matthew 24 about the destruction of the temple are also actually about the final judgment. Or indeed, they're also about us. Quote, Thus, the evangelist also uses some words here in Jesus' teaching in the same way to shed light on the world's final calamity, which is signified by the fall and destruction of Jerusalem for the church's tribulation will be just like this. 
category Luther uses to designate this form of the Holy Spirit's speech in interpenetrating the ages is synecdoche. This literary term refers to using a part to signify the whole, or vice versa, the container for the contain, or a sign to refer to the thing signified. A common example people use today is speaking of the White House to refer to the U.S. presidency and so on. Now, Luther had used this category of synecdoche quite explicitly elsewhere in his writings to explain the Eucharistic presence, where Jesus' words, this is my body, can be applied to a locally circumscribed instance of the Lord's Supper, while also, in fact, truly really signifying the whole reality of Christ's incarnation of self-giving. But in his discussion on Jesus' teaching of the destruction of Jerusalem, Luther uses the term synecdoche to refer to the nature of history itself. The end, the end of time even, is always, these are his words, joined to the beginning, unquote. Both in literary terms, the end of the world is given in the beginning of the Gospels, and in created experience. The last days are always embedded in the present days. That's what temporal synecdoche, historical synecdoche, means for Luther. And this, he also says, is how the world is in fact ordered by God. Now this way of looking at history sets in motion a thoroughgoing figuralism with respect to Jesus' catastrophic teaching. The Jews, the temple, Jerusalem, earthquakes, falling mountains, all of these are ongoing historical realities that must explain our lives in the present for Luther. Hence Matthew 24, Mark 13, he says, also refers to the Turks, to the Pope, to sectarians, and yes, of course, the Jews. In our own day, he says, whose actions in one way or another will always be embodying the words of Jesus. Quote, nothing will change, unquote. Nothing will change, and then he goes on to explain it, quote, except that there will be new persecutions arising, unquote. That is the meaning, he says, of Mark 13, 30 in particular. Quote, this generation shall not pass till all these things be done, unquote. We have to live every single bit of Mark 13. Now, Luther is relentless with this synecdochic reading. Jesus' words, he explains, refer as to the persecutions and terror they unleash to everything that is nearest to each one of us. He's speaking to his listeners in Wittenberg. To your neighbors, to your colleagues you're standing next to or working with, to our magistrates, to townspeople, to peasants, to preachers like me, he says, to your pastors in the villages. And on these matters, Luther goes to town in ways that, of course, are now notorious. He is also palpably honest and concrete about the elements that mark the terror of Jesus' words. He describes not only from the past, but in his own cities and in his listeners' homes, what suffering a pestilence will look like, whether it is plague, pox, or as he goes into some detail, syphilis, or what a fire will destroy, or a war annihilate, or what a famine will eradicate. After all, you see, Luther has seen this with his own eyes. He has felt it with his own body and his own heart, just as have his listeners probably more so. He even tries to restrain himself at one point from getting, from getting too religiously carried away with all this. Many of our sufferings, he says, are man-made, not even divinely orchestrated, the result of greedy merchants and princes hoarding and fanning inflation and stoking famine because of their manipulation of the markets and those on and on as if this helps what people are actually suffering. For in the end, Luther knows that his life and his people's lives are catastrophically ordered. If not today, then they were yesterday, or they will be tomorrow. For those interested in this aspect of Luther, the catastrophic Luther, or of historical synecdoche, I re recommend the volume that appeared a few years ago by Andrew Cunningham and old A. Peter Grell, entitled, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The authors amass a vast amount of documentation that not only demonstrates the consistency of Luther's vibrant concern with catastrophe, but that indicates how widely these concerns were shared by his contemporaries. 
Even more impressively, the volume then carefully lays out in the form of the images of war, famine, and plague, the three horsemen after religion itself in the title, the cascading and cumulative burdens of suffering that, in fact, 16th century and early 17th century North Europeans bore in a way that is quite quantifiable and also quite stunning. Climatic and epidemiological disaster with hundreds of thousands of people dying, either from famine or outright violence and disease, unending warfare, crop failure and hunger, even as principalities and nations crumbled, collapsed, and were barely patched back together again on the ruins of their declining populace during this period, when Europe's population was in fact shrinking. Luther, they suggest, was simply surveying the world as it was, and into that world, the words of Jesus, brought some obvious clarity. To repeat, Luther's synecdotal reading of Jesus' catastrophic pronouncements is not a matter of unthinking tropology. Mark 13 is a moral lesson that we can apply to our lives today. Such application, of course, can be valid, but it is so only because history, in fact, looks this way, and in fact will always look like the events and persons described in Mark 13, since as Luther stresses, quote, the devil still rules the world, unquote. And the dynamics of this relationship are thus, as he puts it, constant for all ages, always, until the end. Just as is, of course, the grace of God on the cross to withstand this. I'll come back to this last point in a moment. For now, let me stress simply how Luther's approach to catastrophe as he exegeted it in texts like Mark 13, constitutes an encompassing reading of history and goes beyond a kind of psychic response to social disaster. One could say, in Luther's own terms, that religion is not reducible to socio-psychological response to existential insecurity. Rather, existential insecurity is itself a reflection of religious truth. It is revelatory of who God is. Doctrinally, Catastrophe given in scriptural terms simply reflects the fact that there is a God and that we are God's creatures who are both utterly incapable of altering that relationship and utterly therefore given over to God's hands for our very breath, judgment, exploration, and recreation. Let me now move to my second part, the political category of catastrophe. What politics might look like in this light is perhaps not very obvious, but is clearly constrained. Luther's own political views shifted over time and situations sometimes wildly. But that almost ad hoc variation in his political teaching reflects the way he understood the ameliorative limits of political agency. Earlier readings of Jesus' catastrophic teaching, because they left out the present, also left politics mostly untouched for good or ill. Not so for Luther. Politics positively tumbles in his vision from its position, if it ever had one, of instrumental good. There's only so much that political agents of the world, princes, magistrates, the church, its leaders, the populace, can do to make things better. Indeed, there's little that can be done at all to make things better in the big picture where catastrophe is not only always around the corner, in the past or future, but is actually ever embedded in the present moment. History has a core, and its core is catastrophe. This is perhaps just the kind of conclusion contemporary critics of catastrophism, of course, decry. But on purely empirical terms, I raise the question, is the conclusion preposterous? And from a Christian political perspective, is Luther an, an unfortunate outlier to readings of Jesus' teaching? I want to turn now to a contemporary version of Cunningham and Grell's Four Horsemen of Apocalypse, a, a human social history, a, a contemporary secular version that looks not only at the 16th century, but at the whole sweep of human history. It's an attempt to analyze not so much Luther's view, but inductively the character of political agency's efficacy 
in a way that in the end reinforces, I believe, aspects of Luther's conclusions. I have in mind Walter Scheidel's book, The Great Level, published just two years ago by Princeton University Press. The subtitle explains Scheidel's project, The Great Leveler, Colin, Violence and the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century. The overall argumentative conclusion of Scheidel is uh, very simple. Income inequality within societies has never really been significantly mitigated by normal political means. Rather, such mitigation has come about only through the catastrophic disruptions in human society caused by what Scheidel imagistically labels the four horsemen of war, revolution, social collapse, and play. For a host of reasons and in various ways, these kinds of disasters, Scheidel argues meticulously, force societies into economic relations where the gap between rich and poor is, sometimes even drastically, narrow. Yet precisely as peace and stability set in, that is, as societies recover from the disruptions of catastrophe, income inequality reasserts itself almost inevitably. While Scheidel has, as a starting point, the various and increasingly unequal economies of nations after World War II, his stunningly vast canvas takes in all of human history. And of the reviews I've read of his book, I have not read one that questions his data. Scheidel is an Austrian-American demographer teaching at Stanford, who initially specialized in studies of the ancient Mediterranean world. But in this recent book, he surveys and analyzes data from across millennia and around the globe. Scheidel builds on a now well-known genre of demographic history, popularized by authors, authors like William McNeil and more recently Jared Diamond. With numbing consistency, Scheidel documents how significant narrowing of income inequality within societies, whether European, South American, Asian, and so on, has almost always been confined to post-catastrophic periods following plagues, invasions, natural disasters, wars, violently destructive revolutions, and the political collapse of nations and their consequent chaos. These post-catastrophic periods, however, rarely last very long. And as political systems are remade, fueled and oiled for long-term use, the old or perhaps new inequalities reassert themselves. Turning to North American life today, he writes in a more popular article, quote, If history is any indication, then, the resurgence of inequality since the 1980s should not have come as any surprise to Americans. In our era, he goes on to say, quote, Making America more equal again will prove the more daunting challenge. Whereas incremental policy measures to shore up the fortunes of the middle class may be desirable and feasible, the past suggests that there is no plausible way to vote, regulate, or teach society back to the levels of equality enjoyed by the initial post-war generation. History cannot predict the future, but its message is, unpa is as unpalatable as it is in clear, as it is clear. With the rarest of exceptions, great reductions in inequality were only ever brought forth in sorrow. It is surely unpalatable to read this. And interestingly, if you read Scheidel's book to the end, he concludes his politically depressing volume by weakly attempting to deflate his conclusions practical horror, thinly arguing for why the four horsemen have perhaps lost their legs in the past 50 years. So he says, pandemics are probably no longer possible in an age of global communication and even partially coordinated medical response. Or again, the threat of catastrophic war has been reined in by nuclear worries, and nuclear war itself is a receding danger, and so on. Thus, he seems to say, however inadequate, contemporary politics is at least left with an increasingly non-catastrophic context in which to work. I doubt. And Scheidel seems to have put aside the realities of, for instance, how AIDS changed the world politically, economically, and culturally. Or how economic dislocation, whatever its causes, 
failed states, climate change, and if only in perception, migration is currently upending stable political systems like those in the UK and the US. But his book, after all, is less interested in the failure of politics than in the successes, as it were, of catastrophe. And thus he ends up inflating catastrophic efficacy while avoiding an analysis of that efficacy's only relative character. That is, it is only because political processes have been intrinsically ineffective that catastrophic social upheaval has been able to provide openings to effective change. And change, at least in terms of this or that measure, for instance, income equalization, for the better. And only sometimes, after all, and needless to say, only at costs that in retrospect may be politically unacceptable. The real question then are the causes for the ineffectiveness of normal politics and why within them catastrophe seems to do better. Here the reasons are clear enough, at least in terms of describing the root of the problem. Normal politics engages in categories that are hopelessly complex and have become ever more so. Catastrophe, by contrast, is effective to the degree that it drastically simplifies these categories, mostly through destructive processes. I'm not going to demonstrate this argument, only state it, but it is a demonstration that cries out to be attempted. The argument is straightforward. The problems facing human societies, especially in a world of expanded populations and networks, something that goes back to the ancient world, mind you, where Shigel cut his teeth, these problems are too complex to be solved through the application of social analysis. And this is for two reasons. The analysis itself will always be inadequate to the problem, and if not outright false, at least misleading. And second, the application of such analysis, given its complexities, is impossible to affect given the multiplication of the players involved. Single cities like London, let alone Cairo or Lagos, now have populations larger by multiple factors than the whole of early modern Britain as a nation put together. How decisions get made about the always pertinent but now exponentially complicated issues of resource allocation in such contexts continues to baffle political systems. Some have argued that democratic systems begin to lose their decisional functionality in groups larger than 100,000 people. And once you hit half a million, democratic systems no longer do anything useful. Not to mention how we deal with all the other developments that have gone in tandem with them in some major respects that have permitted this demographic expansion, science, technology, medicine, universities, education, mobility, communication, and finally the cultural ramifications and convolutions that have arisen both around and within these other dynamics, shaping attitudes and habits of individuals and groups, value pluralism, consumable leisure, choice in multiplied and conflicting optionalities. Complexity theory has tried to address particular issues here, but applied to politics more broadly, it seems intrinsically useless, and always behind the curve of challenge, and many people have argued this. It is not so much that consequential decisions cannot be made politically around any number of issues in our day. It is simply that such decisions will always prove unable to catch up with the problems they target and will, in turn, in the process, create ever new knots of opposing interest groups and vying elites, who in turn will snarl ongoing decision-making as the process moves along. Around the eddies of political science are those who, like Scheidel, have been studying why fine-tuning or even changing wholesale the democratic process leads only to further disaffection, social fragmentation and polarization, and finally paralysis. Applied to the actual context of countries like the US or the UK and its political issues in the present, their analyses seem ever more pertinent. The complexity of normal politics in this case is clearly tied to the driving energies of catastrophe, where overwhelming events like drought in Africa or civil collapse in Central America with all their migratory pressures hover in an extraordinarily complex way behind the reactive confusions of nations geographically far away. From this perspective, there is a clear reason then why catastrophe is effective in political terms. It destroys complexities. Catastrophe does so by destroying peoples, their institutions, their desires, 
and the impossibly manipulated networks of decision making that gum up the works. Catastrophe does not lead to good leaders or strong vision in itself. How could it? It can crush these as much as it crushes anything. But catastrophe clears the field, as it were, with its sweeping forces. And the narrative of de novo, something new, will sometimes include, as well, new clarities of decision and action, not always. Certainly in the wake of the four horsemen, there are fewer pieces to involve, whether a person's interests or pressures. And the point here is not to celebrate catastrophe. God forbid. It is rather to disabuse ourselves of certain presuppositions about the way politics itself works and ought to be defined. In the light of the catastrophic character of social change, and hence political judgment, force or otherwise, then we can say the following. First, catastrophe it is, it appears, the unhappy partner of normal politics. It breaks in, it breaks apart, it stirs up political action in ever new ways. Second, catastrophe is, even more specifically, an aspect of whether we want to go with Scheidel or not and say it's a necessary aspect, it's another matter. Catastrophe, at least, is a central aspect of ameliorative politics. The politics, uh, the work political agents do to, quote, make common life better. So that we could say that catastrophe is normal politics' stalking horse, behind which our quotidian political efforts work themselves out if often in a desultory fashion. So third, catastrophe then is a normal part and a part of normal Christian politics to the degree that Christians engage politically at all. Catastrophe is not an outlier, nor is it a religiously perverse obsession. Just the opposite. Catastrophe, just because normal politics is bondage to its force, is religiously central. And so to my last lecture, Christian catastrophic apology, uh, politics. I do think these points have their practical consequences. They ought to relativize and disrupt the ameliorative assumptions of much modern Christian politics. They ought also to reorient what counts as the political in Christian terms towards alternative goods, alternative or in addition to that is normal political calculation as it is ameliorative. The goods of this life are, in fact, other than we might normally imagine. Put in a more traditional way, Christian politics, no surprise, conceives of the goods of human life in terms other than those offered by the world. Luther's reading of Jesus' catastrophic teaching ought in this light to take on a newly compelling character. As Luther's explicit, synecdochic reading of Jesus' historical predictions explains, we are ever in the midst of catastrophe. But more than that, because this kind of history, which is scripturally inscribed within and outside the text, is by definition of a, a divinely wrought reality somehow, that is the nature of scriptural synecdoche as a figural reality, catastrophe is a Christian theological category par excellence. If cat catastrophe is simply, though often horrendously, a form of change, and the word itself indicates this, catastrophe means overturning, something that happens in the face of human incapacity, political or otherwise, then catastrophe's historical meaning for Christians ought to be a central uh, theological concern. The Christian faith, for instance, makes fundamental claims about the shape of individual catastrophe, given in terms of suffering, loss, and death, doesn't it? These have been defined in terms of the inevitable character of human creatureliness, i.e. mortality, and however shaped by sin, human incapacity. But Christianity is also deeply concerned with social catastrophe, although this topic, in a way that exceeds the modern obscuring of individual limitation and even evanescence, has been mostly muted in recent Christian discussion, except as a kind of a claim to uh, vigorously hold at bay. Leaving aside the catastrophe elaborated in the kinds of apocalyptic description disdained by contemporary critics of fundamentalistic Christian millennialism, including that in the book of Revelation, the fact is that the scriptures as a whole 
represent human history as extended, variegated, and consistently catastrophic, such that Mark 13 is itself but a figure among many similar figures. In this respect, it is this aspect of the chapter that I want to stress, i.e. that it is all very familiar, John and Mark 13, in scriptural terms, and not at all a marginal and astonishing inbreaking of terror. Indeed, so-called apocalyptic literature is really very similar to wisdom literature and outlining the meaning of quotidian normality. From the early chapters of Genesis through the New Testament epistles, including the Gospels, peoples, nations, and of course Israel in particular, are subjected to repeated catastrophic experience. Floods, including the first huge one. Droughts, invasions, plagues, Pests, rats, grasshoppers, earthquakes, barbarians, the cruel, the weak, the sinful. At the center of the Bible itself is a kind of supreme catastrophic figure. The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and the complete dismantling of Israel's political system. But the cross itself, and it sounds like we're going to hear more about this later, engages this figure explicitly, thus locates catastrophe at the center of Christian theology, in such a way that apocalyptic cataclysm, when it appears in the Gospels and letters, involving the sudden destruction of large proportions of the human race, appears as an extension of a Christian theological vision, rather than as novel and extraneous perspectives that somehow require newly minted exegetical tools. Perhaps early Christian interpreters of Mark 13 did not talk much in terms of contemporary reference because the connection was so clear as to be banal. And Luther's interests are not so much new as newly pressured by a changing set of cultural expectations. If this is so then, the developing early modern and modern line of Christian political theology, which aimed at engaging efficacity of decision making, either positively or correctively, in democratic or revolutionary terms, can at best be but a secondary mode of ecclesial ethics. Rather, the primary mode of Christian politics should be aimed at living faithfully within or in the face of catastrophe, not effectively preventing it or evading it. Catastrophe is often viewed as an end-time category, and that has in part been, has in part been the basis for critiquing its usefulness. It is, as it were, a counsel of despair, as well as a perverted and ultimately lazy trust in the value of ultimate destruction. Why bother trying, since it's all about to go up in smoke anyway? That's been the argument, negative argument. But to pick up Luther and to press the point about Scripture's own historical narrative, biblical catastrophism is not primarily about the end of all things, even if that end is also given. Rather, catastrophism is about change, change that lies mostly outside of human control. Hence, catastrophe in a Christian sense is not about endings, but about the character of the middle that lies between unsought beginnings and inevitable endings. That middle is, of course, characterized by a host of smaller, if wrenching, endings. But it is a middle, nonetheless, in the sense that it is the place where we do our living. How do we live, for instance? when, as children, our parents die? How do we live when, as parents, our children die? How do we live when our home burns down, or is blown down, or is washed away with everything in it? How do we live when rivers and crops dry up? How do we live when our leaders are arrested and executed, and the same fate hangs over our own labor? How do we live when a spouse falls dreadfully ill. Anybody here, certainly if you have worked in a pastor setting, have lived through and engaged every one of those catastrophes in their small way. Some of you, I'm quite certain, have lived through them personally. Catastrophe marks the character of change within a mortal existence, but that existence is nonetheless given to be lived. When Jesus lays out the catastrophic character of human history in Mark 13, he lists a whole host of familiar realities. Being arrested, I'm afraid that's very familiar. Being beaten, alas. 
being falsely accused, being betrayed, being in flight, being frozen, and so on. We think these are weird. Most of the history of the world, almost everybody encountered these during their lives at one time or another. But in fact, as I said, it's also part and parcel of the middle time reality, all in its own way, from family disintegration to the clear moment of witness. What Jesus says about actual life in these times ends up being quite simple. Verse 13, endure. He who endures the end will be saved. Endurance is salvation, in a way. And endurance, a word that has as its root, as we know in the Greek, a steady remaining in place, becomes a paradoxical key to life. One stays and lives through that which seems to assault the ground on which one stands and the life that one sees slipping from one hands. The Christian politics of catastrophe, that is the Christian politics carried out in the midst of the normal politics of complex incapacity, is, I suggest, the politics of endurance. I'm here only making a suggestion rather than outlining the program. So let me end with three points about Christian politics in this light under the banner of perhaps. Perhaps, first of all, Christian politics is ascetic. The main entry into this reality is given in Mark 13, 13, as I said, whoever endures to the end will be saved. Endurance, or in the Latin translation, patience, paciencia, pomone, paciencia, were terms not only used in the New Testament as translations, and other ones, the Septuagint, uh, usages of the Old Testament, macrothemia, they have a profound role to play in the New Testament especially. And as we know, they gave rise to a great spiritual tradition that remains, unfortunately, mostly forgotten and unmined in our contemporary era, though it was central to the church from the first life through to the early modern period. From Tertullian and Cyprian and their linkage of endurance to martyrdom, to Cassian, and his location of patience as a central communal grace and virtue through the Franciscan discussions of the nature of service, patientia and its formation became a central lens through which to view the Christian's relationship with God, the church, and the world. And as is clear in Mark 13's figural threads, endurance is a central Christological reality, which I think we'll hear more about later. Curiously, social scientists have been orbiting around this unknown planet more recently without realizing it, focusing on the character and shape of things like resilience, or loyalty, or constancy in situations of communal chaos and trauma. So I suggest that endurance becomes both goal and form of Christian politics in a central way, and that that's worth thinking about. Secondly, the second point on such politics, which follows from the first, is that it is catechetical and formational in method. Endurance is a grace, as the tradition has insisted, but it is also learned in the sense of being bound up with discipleship, or of watching, following, being shaped. And I need to say a bit more about this. Luther himself, you see, explicitly and interestingly grabs hold of the formational issue in his discussion exactly of Jesus' catastrophic teaching. His vision may seem paradoxical. On the one hand, Luther sees Jesus' articulation of history's ordering as driven by a deep relativizing of all worldly goods, peace, health, harmony, prosperity, security, the kinds of things normal politics aims at. All these are phil phil uh, physical goods that are bound up with the figure, alas, in, Jew in Luther's view of Jewish blindness, the Jews themselves figuring the false valuation of body in things like temples, sacrifices, and wonderful great cities like Jerusalem. The historical destruction of all that, that Jesus predicts, Luther says, is real enough. It came under the Romans. He can point to that as much as anybody else. Now, Luther's anti-Semitism is grotesque and traditional, and I would not for an instant excuse it. But our repugnance for it also shouldn't obscure his larger point. For it's anecdotally, the destruction of our worldly goods continues to come in our day, for him, under Turks, under the popes, and the broader array of the devil's minions who populate contemporary life. 
All of such goods are useless, Luther insists, and in the most tangible of ways. Today, Luther writes at the end of his sermons on this passage, quote, Many good-hearted people say and desire, Come, dear Lord Jesus, for there is no government. Everyone does what he wants. Our preaching isn't going to help. The secular authorities are so lax. So let the thunder and the lightning strike and throw it all into a heap, unquote. That's what he's preaching to his listeners. Try that. See if it goes over in your churches. Into a heap. This, however, is a stable Lutheran theme, as we all know, consistent with his famous verse from Ein Festival. Nehmen Sie den Lied, den Leib, gut er Kind und Weib. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. Kindred, that is to say children and wives, is what he's referring to, literally. True goods for Luther are always spiritual, and these ultimately come down to faith itself. It wouldn't matter if the Pope was just a thief, Luther says. We can live with the Pope who's a robber. The problem is when our faith is destroyed by bad people. Why? Because you need faith to endure. You see, and here's the paradox. For on the one hand, faith is given for Luther in very concrete ways. The word preached, the sacraments performed, and finally, he says, in the catechism. If Luther says, quote, the devil and the heretics constantly boast that they are bringing the truth, the answer is clear for us. He's telling his listeners. Let everyone work hard at learning the catechism well. That's his answer to the devil. Learn the catechism well. All the real physical catastrophes that Jesus talks about, and they are real, Luther knows that, are also figures of spiritual destruction as well. And that's what we should worry about. And the way to deal with this properly and well depends upon this worldly responsibilities ecclesially defined. As I said, sacraments, preaching, and teaching. Now, there's nothing here about withdrawal, and of course Luther is the last person to be read in a sectarian manner. Rather, spiritual goods are grasped for Luther through vital communal existence, social life, political life, finally family life, all ordered with regard to the common life of the Church of Christ, to be sure, but ordered publicly and tangibly. And of course, as we know, this is all part of the tenor of something like a shorter catechism, and it informs large parts of the longer catechism, especially, but not only in Luther's treatment of the Decalogue. However much Luther knew that in the end one must let goods and kindred go, these realities, goods and kindred, find a redeemed, godly, and historically necessary use when applied to the Christian faith. The picture Luther leaves then is not exactly asocial or even apolitical in any normal sense. The question is ends. What are our social and political efforts finally aimed at? In the context of Jesus' words in Mark 13, the end here is endurance, by which Luther means, as he explains, faith itself. Faith that can last to the end, when everything else falls apart. And he gives a list of possible falling aparts. When Germany itself crashes down, like Egypt and North Africa earlier chronically notes, when the church disintegrates, when Christendom goes up in smoke, the whole lot annihilated by the oncoming Turks or whoever they may be, faith must be taught, it must be learned, and it must be lived during and to the end of those times. Politics, that is, exists for the faith or for faith, not the other way. And as a result, the Christian politics then, this was my second point, must aim at the kind of endurance that comes from the faith's profound teaching and inculcation. And any Christian politics that doesn't take the church's freedom or strength and ability to do such teaching is missing its central goal. Finally, and this follows from the catechetical insight of someone like Luther, a Christian politics is familiar. This is probably the most controversial point to be made, because it goes to elements of normal politics that are currently in enormous and bitter dispute. On the one hand, this point derives from points one and two. The family is the primordial and richest source of formational catechetics, given as this is in marriage, given as this is in marriage and child rearing, where it happens. But family is also a political entity, if sui generis, 
as all political theorists since Aristotle at least understood. I will say no more about this except that Christians are not mistaken in battling the formless ground. The family and its formational life and character is central to Christian politics because endurance in the faith is fundamental. All these elements of a Christian catastrophic politics, its ascetic, its catechetical, its familial concerns, are not idiosyncratically suggested on my part. They have, in fact, tended, in perhaps quite different nuances, to inform contemporary interest in one of the major recent orientations of Christian social thinking, that is to say, diasporic politics. George Limbeck was one of the first to press this category in his own way, but more recently a host of thinkers, including nearby to us, Travis Craker and Masters, who have explored this theme from the Anabaptist perspectives, as have others from post-colonial perspectives. My point is that such diasporic theory, which deserves careful consideration, I think, is properly located in the category of catastrophe. And hence, the place to study it is just in terms of the character of Jesus' words in a place like Mark 13. What, after all, is the first catastrophe described here? The destruction of the temple at Jerusalem. And who are its first participants, victims, and survivors? The Jews. Jewish diaspora, which is embedded in the scriptures from Genesis on, is thus the great figure of Christian politics. And this figure and its details stretch forth to the post-temple eras of imperial Rome, through the Middle Ages, through early and late modernity to the present. The experience is that that experience, the Jewish diaspora, ought to be the school for Christian politics. And it is only recently beginning to receive some attention that it should, in political scientific terms. You can look at people who are beginning to do this. But my point is that when it comes to the ascetic, catechetical, and familial dimensions of Christian catastrophic politics, to quote Jesus, salvation comes from the Jews. The logic follows the simple evangelical thread that moves from um, John 13, 1, having loved his own, that we're in the world he loved to the end, through the hinge verse of Mark 13, 13, whoever endures to the end will be saved, and finally locates the originating form of that salvation in the Jews themselves. This was the insight Luther struggled unsuccessfully to, to articulate, hampered as it was by his own in centuries of anti-Judaism. But there it was, waiting to be grasped. The great historical synecdoche of Mark 13 had properly brought the church finally into the actual fold. Of Israel. The question, just to end, of normal politics, of course, remains. For instance, in the face of climate change, campaign finance reform, or immigration, catastrophes are not to be desired, even if they are the inevitable motor for real political change. And normal political efforts need to be pursued to avoid them. I will only hint at its proper place in the shadow of catastrophe. Normal politics, to use the Cunian analogy, is what, one, is what one does in between catastrophes. Normal politics uh, continues to make demands, therefore, on Christians in impromptu and provisional ways. Christians in, but not of the world, properly continue to respond, though in ways I think that ought to be anti-theoretical and only loosely strategic. At the same time, Christian catastrophic politics and its subcategory of ad hoc responses ought to press the church herself away from practicing normal politics in her own life. That is not what the church is about. To turn away from a concern with internal normal politics would turn the church into something potentially useful, paradoxically, to the evacuating political life of the larger human community as witness, as example. As eleven. Hence, a Christian politics of catastrophe prioritizes the endurance of the, of the church over that of the state. It therefore sets priorities within its relationship with the state that favors elements of such endurance, many of which are at the center of present debate. On the other hand, a Christian politics of catastrophe will in fact favor acts that can be ordered to the common good independently of the constraints of normal political adjudications. Much of this is already intuitively recognized by many. Its profound imperative, however, may only come to light in the posture of wakefulness and watching 
that arises in the midst of strange and perplexing 